Good evening, I'm Janelle Lamassa. Ian is away. Tonight, the protest arrives on Parliament Hill. The convoy starts to roll into Ottawa. Tonight, tracking the truckers and their supporters and what they're planning for the days to come as Ottawa's police hit the streets in force. Starting today, Ottawa residents can expect to see a large police and emergency services presence. It does make me anxious. Definitely not going anywhere tomorrow. Also tonight, a week to go until the games. And some Canadians are already caught up in China's COVID rules. The Canadian men's soccer team, another step closer to their goal. Jonathan David! Getting to the World Cup. And, how does it feel? and why music legends are selling off their songs. This is The National. You're looking at the scene in Ottawa tonight where demonstrators are coming together from all over Canada, converging on Parliament Hill in a protest against COVID-19 vaccine mandates. They've been on the move for days, picking up trucks, cars, RVs and momentum as they draw closer to Ottawa. With some now already in place in front of Parliament, security in the city is tight and the situation tense. <laughs> The demonstrations this weekend will be unique, fluid, risky, and significant. What is certain is that the weekend protest will be big. Less certain is how it'll all play out and when it'll end. Organizers are promising peaceful demonstrations, but police do worry that people bent on violence could enter the mix. We begin our coverage tonight with Travis Danraj. And Travis, you've been speaking with people in the convoy today. What's happening in Ottawa tonight? Well, listen, what would usually be a very quiet winter's night here in Ottawa, Janela, is anything but tonight. It is loud, it is busy, and hundreds of protesters have already arrived to stake out their spot near Parliament Hill for tomorrow's big rally. <laughs> Sounds of horns blared all over downtown Ottawa on a frigid night. The cold not keeping protesters from delivering their message. I'm a vaxxed trucker and I'm here to support my unvaxxed colleagues. It's wrong to force people to undergo a med medical procedure against their will. What I have been seeing so far is every single Canadian doing what they do and is peacefully protesting and loving each other and spreading cheer and hope and happiness. Yeah! Just take a look around. We are in front of the Parliament buildings right now and there are already hundreds of protesters, dozens of trucks lining Wellington Street and this is just the night before. The main convoys, well, they haven't even arrived yet. Indeed, thousands more are expected by early afternoon. Convoys from the east, west and south on the road today, all set to converge in Ottawa. The leader of the official opposition tweeted he met with truckers today and says Trudeau should do the same. The prime minister is isolating because of a COVID exposure. You're prepared to stay for a month? Yeah. I got a month's worth of food in there. At this truck stop about an hour down the road, truckers arrive saying they are prepared to stay in Ottawa for weeks, even longer. They want to see an end to the vaccine mandate for cross-border truckers and say it puts the supply chain at risk. If we're not bringing the food, if we're not bringing the products, you guys are screwed. So you mess with the truckers, you have to deal with it. The convoy has picked up people with a variety of grievances along the way. As for concerns about security, the protesters we talk to say that's media and government hype. We're all doing this peacefully. We all have to sign a contract and a uh, code of conduct. We're all on board with this. This is for all of Canada, not just for Ontario or not just for the truckers. This is for everyone. And we continue to hear those horns blaring behind you tonight. Travis, what else did you hear from the people you spoke to today? Well, a lot of the truckers that we talk to say that this is about their livelihood. It is about their ability to provide for their families. Some say that they can't get the vaccine. Others say that this is a fundamental infringement upon their freedoms as Canadians. And they say that they're not going to back down until the mandate is lifted. Janella? All right, CBC's Travis Danrich. Thanks so much. Well, as Travis mentioned, the protest is prompting some security concerns from police, Ottawa businesses and residents. Hannah Thibodeau was on Parliament Hill earlier and lays out how the city is preparing. 
This is the scene from Parliament Hill. As you can see, trucks, tractors, even RVs lining the street three thick. And as the protest grew, so did major security preparations. Police putting out barricades, setting up cameras, and even calling in other jurisdictions. And as night fell, the tone of the protests also changed. Truckers and protesters remained peaceful well into the night. But as the scene got louder, the police presence grew. These demonstrations are national in scope. They are massive in scale. Unfortunately, they are polarizing in nature. It's making some downtown residents anxious. It's very stressful and it's very like, this is the only thing that's taken up our minds the whole day. Well, the past like three, four days actually, because of the buildup. Organizers say they intend to demonstrate peacefully, but police say they are concerned about lone wolves. We've had new intelligence coming in in regards to local threats. As individuals or groups, they may seek to come here physically to cause harm to the city, to disrupt lawful demonstrations, or that may be inciting hate and or criminal violence online. Support for the protest has spread beyond Canada's borders. A CBC News analysis shows some donations made to a GoFundMe campaign in support of the convoy appear to have come from outside the country. And some of the largest donations were made anonymously. International stars have also spoken out, like actor Russell Brand. Here's to the Canadian truckers. Here's to standing up for freedom. Meanwhile, back in Ottawa, businesses one block from the demonstrations are worried especially after already being hit hard financially by pandemic shutdowns. A lot of these people, as they're truckers and such, they're independent business people. So we hope that, again, uh, everyone is, is smart enough to realize that uh, uh, they'll be doing more harm than good uh, by causing damage or destruction. Police have warned people not to come into the downtown core and that this protest could last into next week. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. And today, some Quebecers showed their support for the convoy as trucks and other vehicles headed to Ottawa. A number of truckers in Quebec gathered at border crossings before hitting the road to the main event. Sarah Levitt visited a truck stop at one of those crossings to dial into some of the conversations there. At one of Canada's busiest land border crossings, the convoy is a hot topic. I think it's awesome. This American truck driver says he first heard about the protest on his way through Georgia. He's vaccinated, but he's opposed to mandates. We only got 40 drivers now that can cross. So it's 40 guys that are going back and forth, back and forth, and staying up just to keep commerce going. While Canada requires all truckers entering the country to be vaccinated, the U.S. has a similar rule for non-Americans. The Canadian Trucking Alliance says the majority of those making the trips are already vaccinated, up to 90 percent. If you're vaccinated, you protect you and you protect all the, the older people. The requirements are essential, says this Canadian truck driver. CBC News agreed to keep his name confidential because he fears repercussions for speaking out against the protest heading to Ottawa. For me, it's, it's a joke. It's a minority, but this minority uh, doesn't respect the rule. He's not the only one surprised by the aggressive intolerance for any disagreement. This truck driver with a popular industry blog recently came out against the protest. I get every hour maybe two or three really bad uh, emails or messages and I don't really want to talk about it because I'm worried it's going to influence people to find me online and, and send me more. Though vaccinated, Frédéric Bisson is just out of isolation after contracting COVID from a colleague. He doesn't like how this protest has evolved. While we didn't sign up for that kind of protest, we didn't think it was going to be like that. And now we feel, and I feel, it's a little bit out of control. So he'll stay away and continue to take this crossing alongside many others. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, St. Bernard de la Colle, Quebec. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is self-isolating over COVID concerns, and his office has now confirmed to CBC News why. 
It's because one of his children tested positive for the virus. The Prime Minister said on Thursday he would self-isolate for five days in accordance with guidelines from Ottawa Public Health. Well, Canadian health officials offered a note of cautious optimism about the pandemic today, coupled with a warning. Omicron cases have now peaked nationwide, but hospitalizations have not. The massive spike that began just after the holidays shows signs of leveling off, but the number of COVID-19 patients in hospital continues to break records, with roughly 11,000 Canadians in a hospital bed. Of those, more than 1,200 are in intensive care, and more Canadians than ever are still dying. Well, Omicron has tested Canada's health care system like nothing before. And as Christine Birak shows us, that test is not over, despite some hopeful signs. Infections are coming down and optimism is rising, but health officials insist the Omicron wave isn't over yet, as record-breaking numbers of Canadians are now dying and lying in hospitals. Presently, lagging indicators are still rising. Over the same period, an average of close to 10,800 people with COVID-19 are being treated in our hospitals each day. This graph shows confirmed daily deaths in Canada since the beginning of the pandemic. Omicron's massive surge in infections this month has led to a new peak in COVID deaths. Over 300 Canadians died just yesterday. I can tell you, um, with full transparency, it is getting harder. The latest numbers show nearly 82% of Canadians are now fully vaccinated. This month, those Canadians made up roughly 14% of COVID hospitalizations and deaths, while nearly three quarters of hospital patients and those who've died were unvaccinated. Still, overburdened healthcare workers remain hopeful. I'm still optimistic that there is light at the end of the tunnel and um, I'm going to push through because that's what we have to do. If you look at the pandemic in general, we've come a long way and we've got effective things that have taken the mortality from one in 100 down to really what amounts to being one in 500. Ontario and Quebec are preparing to loosen restrictions next week, but others aren't. As we all learn to live with the virus, it is critical that we stay the course over the next week. Manitoba's maintaining measures after data from wastewater suggested infections may be increasing again. And PEI is now cancelling some surgeries as it grapples with its largest COVID-19 surge of this pandemic. Even though it may seem as though the worst of Omicron may be behind us, we all want to continue to exercise prudence and to follow public health advice. Health experts are expecting Omicron cases, hospitalizations and deaths will drop significantly by spring. But as long as other parts of the world remain unvaccinated, new variants remain a threat. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, let's dive a little deeper with infectious diseases specialist, Dr. Isaac Bogosh. Hi, Dr. Bogosh, good to see you. Good to see you as well. So, you know, we heard there this country seeing a record number of COVID-19 patients in hospital, this week record number of daily deaths. But tell us what you're seeing in your hospital at first hand. What's different this time around? Well, certainly there are a large number of cases that can't uh, be stressed enough. And, and certainly there are fewer and fewer people working in hospital as well. That just makes it more challenging. There's the staffing shortages are really exacerbating a lot of the issues. Uh, we see a lot of the same. I mean, people who have three doses of a vaccine who end up in hospital or two doses of a vaccine who end up in hospital tend to not be as sick uh, compared to those who remain unvaccinated. But still, there are a lot of sick people in hospital and we're providing them with the best care that we possibly can. Now, we did hear in Christine's story that there still is a sense of optimism among many health officials. Do you feel the same way? I do. I really do. I think I think if we look at all the trends. We see all the arrows pointing in the right direction. We don't have a good reflection of what the true case count is in Canada because many of the places uh, are now focusing tests to priority areas, but the metrics that we can measure are improving and that's, that's good. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of deaths. We know deaths are a lagging indicator, but I think with enough time, we'll start to see those deaths start to come down as well, which would be a very welcome sign. All right, Dr. Isaac Bogosh, thanks so much. My pleasure. Turning to Beijing now, where at least five members of Canada's Olympic team who just arrived are now caught up in the organizers' COVID-19 protocols just one week before the official start of the Winter Games. Rene Filipponi shares what we know about that as Beijing makes its final extremely careful push to be ready. 
Chinese officials are taking no chances. With strict COVID protocols in place, anyone involved in the Beijing Olympics will spend the games behind fences. International media, some who've been here for weeks, say their movements are limited. Japan was not that strict like this, like in Beijing. The people felt a little bit more relaxed to stay in Tokyo, but here it's like really strict. So I think there's a lot of stress. Despite having three COVID tests before flying to Beijing, those members of Canada's Olympic team that have been placed in COVID-19 protocol would have either tested positive on arrival or been a close contact of someone positive. The Canadian Olympic Committee says there will likely be persistent shedders among the delegation, meaning people who test positive long after they had COVID. They will need multiple negative tests to get out of isolation. The risk is not zero, but with basic precautions, the risk should be tolerable. And I think that we saw with um, the Tokyo Olympics. Twelve years ago, David Cobb was getting ready for the Vancouver Olympics. He says the lead up to any games is stressful, never mind COVID. You know, they have to make sure that uh, they do everything they can to keep the virus out of their bubble. Um, certainly for the athletes, but all the other officials and people that participate in one way or another. So that's, I'm sure, their toughest challenge right now. Outside the Olympic bubble, residents in Beijing are concerned. This woman says she hopes that everyone stays safe and healthy. Very few tickets to events will be available to locals. A disappointment for this sports fan who wanted to be in the stands. Instead, she, like so many others, will be watching these games from home. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, as we get closer to the Olympics, be sure to stay with CBC for all the action from Beijing. Get ready for the sights and sounds of the world's best athletes going for gold. CBC is the official broadcaster for the Olympic Winter Games and we'll be bringing you all the drama from the ski hill to the skating rink, plus the challenges of holding a global event during a pandemic. Adrian will be hosting the national from Beijing in the days leading up to the opening ceremony and will lead our coverage throughout the Games. Adrian and Andrew will host special coverage of the opening ceremony on February 4th alongside Scott Russell from CBC Sports. That all starts at 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Well, the timing of the Olympic Games may be a consideration when it comes to the escalating tensions between Russia and Ukraine. As Susan Ormiston shows us, the warnings from the West got louder today. We strongly encourage Russia to stand down. The top U.S. general and the defense secretary warning. This is larger in scale and scope uh, in the massing of forces than anything we have seen um, uh, in recent memory. If Russia unleashes ballistic missiles, artillery, and with air support amassed near the border, expect significant casualties. It would be horrific. It would be terrible. Russia doesn't want a war, said its foreign minister, but it won't let its interests be violated. Vladimir Putin, in a call with the French president, said the U.S. and NATO are still ignoring Russia's security demands, that NATO limit its expansion eastwards. But he agreed to continue talks. What does Putin really want? Ivo Dalder, a former U.S. ambassador to NATO, believes Putin is masking his real red line. While he keeps on talking about NATO, about Ukraine not being allowed to be a member of NATO, I think what's really going on is that Putin really doesn't want an independent Ukraine next door to Russia. And now that Putin has provoked this tension, he'll want to gain something back. He can't just step down and step away from it and say, oh, uh, sorry, I made a mistake. And whether that is a military incursion or something else uh, that leads to the destabilization of the government in, in Kyiv, I don't see him doing anything less than that. More U.S. ammunition and weapons are bound for Ukraine this weekend. President Biden said tonight troops to the region will follow. I'll be moving U.S. troops to Eastern Europe and the NATO countries in the near term. Next week, a pause perhaps for the Beijing Olympics where Putin is set to meet with the Chinese president. The calculation that Xi Jinping wouldn't react well to Putin starting a war in Europe now. So maybe a window for dialogue. Susan Ormason, CBC News, Washington. 
Well, U.S. President Joe Biden was in Pittsburgh today to promote his infrastructure plan. And just hours ahead of the president's landing, a major bridge collapsed. No one was killed, but 10 people were injured when the 50-year-old bridge caved in. Several people were taken to hospital. It sounded like a huge snowplow pushing along a raw tarmac surface with no snow. The president took the opportunity to tour the scene, pledging more investment. Well, back in Ottawa, protesters have started arriving on Parliament Hill with plenty more en route. Tonight, we'll go beyond the headlines with the concerns over who the convoy may have picked up along the way. We need to detach the truckers in this convoy from, it, from any racist or hate speech. Plus, Bob Dylan becomes the latest musician to cash in. How does it feel? Why the legends are suddenly selling off their music. But first, a big win brings the Canadian men one step closer to the World Cup. Jonathan Dana! That story in just two minutes. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're learning more details tonight about that shooting in Richmond, B.C. that left four members of the same family dead. Homicide investigators are confirming that this does not appear to be an incident of partner violence. At this stage, preliminary findings suggest that one of the family members was the shooter. Investigators are waiting on test results to confirm which family member was the shooter, but could only say that it wasn't the father. The bodies were found on Tuesday of a 74-year-old father, a 58-year-old mother, and two adult children aged 23 and 21. In Kaluit's 8,000 residents are being told the city's water is now safe to drink. Health officials lifted a boil water advisory tonight, nine days after fuel was detected in the city's water supply again. To solve the issue, officials built a bypass system at the water treatment plant. The Edmonton Oilers introduced their latest acquisition today. Forward Evander Kane has signed a one-year deal with the team. The 30-year-old has made headlines recently for suspensions due to violations of COVID protocols and most recently allegations of abuse from his estranged wife. Those allegations haven't been proven in court. At a news conference today, he said he's not perfect. I take responsibility for things that uh, I've done wrong, but I'm definitely not going to take any responsibility for things I haven't done. Kane is expected to make his Oilers debut when the team faces Montreal Saturday night. Well, Canada's men's soccer team has achieved redemption for a decades-old defeat, winning in Honduras for the first time since 1985. And as Aaron Collins explains, it's another landmark win on their quest to the World Cup. All business. Buchanan through the sixes and all goal. In hostile Honduras, Canada's men got a little help from their hosts, an own goal to get the ball rolling. Oh. Celebrated by their biggest star from afar, Alfonso Davies, sidelined by myocarditis after having COVID-19. Well well Fraser goes long, pings one for David. Look at that control. Oh. Jonathan David! But the Canadians helped themselves too, winning in Honduras for the first time in over 35 years. A win that kept the Canadians at the top of the table and on track to qualify for their first World Cup since 1986. You know, we, we bent a little bit, but we didn't break. And that's uh, the story, I think, of, of the identity of this team. A nearly 5,000 kilometres north rave reviews of the result from supporters here. I thought it was really good. It's really good to see how far Canada's come, especially with like our younger players playing for higher clubs like Alfonso Davies playing for Bayern Munich. And after a win without Davies in the lineup, new hope here that Canada can win its next match against the U.S. I think it will be definitely a tough match, but I think Canada definitely has a chance to win, like by far, yeah. The Americans are second in their qualifying group, just a point behind the Canadians, and the two teams square off Sunday in Hamilton. You know, it would be a statement victory by the Canadians, and it, I think it would put them well on their way to qualifying for Qatar. Well, back on the pitch in Calgary, confidence that for the first time in decades, Canada's men can get the job done. I think it's super exciting to see um, how well the men have come and how successful they're being, and I think they're catching up to the women's. Canada's men have a long way to go before they can catch the country's women. 
They're ranked 40th now, and of course, the women are the reigning Olympic champions. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. We'll return to our top story as protests converge on Parliament Hill this weekend. We want to go beyond the headlines. Next, the concern over who has joined the convoy along the way. Plus, The government of New Brunswick tries something different and gets a different reaction. Stay with us. As a protest convoy arrives in Ottawa, many have raised concerns about people with extreme views that have attached themselves to that protest. They have very little to do with truckers. Let's go beyond the headlines and take a look at what's fueling the movement and whether the message has gone off track. Joining me now is Mike Million. He's the president of the Private Motor Truck Council of Canada. And Evan Balgord is the executive director of the Canadian Anti-Hate Network. Thanks to both of you for being with us. And I'll start with you, Mike. Uh, let me get your take on this convoy from what it started as to where it is now. Yeah, well, thanks for having me tonight. And let us start off by saying, you know, that the PMTC is is in favor of people's rights to peacefully protest. It's what makes Canada a great country. Uh, in saying that, we have to make sure it's done right, which is, you know, polite, peaceful, respectful of others, and making sure we don't endanger people's health and safety. The convoy itself, <clears throat> even before it hit the road on on January 23rd. Early on in January, in social media, it, it was purported to be a border vaccine mandate convoy to do with the border vaccine mandate that was coming into effect on January 15th for drivers coming into Canada, as well as a federal vaccine mandate that the Liberal government told us in December would be coming into effect in early 2022. Are you concerned about the groups that have attached themselves to this and, and some might say have co-opted this? For sure. Um, you know, we, we spoke out a couple of days ago. There's, unfortunately, with protests now, there seems to be these groups, and we've seen it a lot more in the last four or five years, and especially in the last two years since COVID. We see these almost professional protester groups that will attach onto a movement and then kind of put their own message and put their own spin on things. Uh, so we are concerned with some of the rhetoric that we've heard, but I, I would like to say that you know, we believe the majority of that rhetoric is not coming from the trucking industry uh, or the truckers that are involved in this convoy. We we did encourage, we spoke out against the rhetoric that we've heard denouncing violence, you know, racist comments, um, comparing it to, to Nazi movements. You know, there's no place for that in our mind and you have to speak down against that. The convoy, some of their organizers did come out yesterday and also spoke out against it, which we were good glad to see and have told their members to report it to the police if it's there. We need to detach the industry and detach the truckers in this convoy from, it, from any racist or hate speech that okay. goes on. I want to... I want to bring Evan into this conversation. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you know about some of these specific groups who have uh, been uh, involved in this protest? Yeah, and I, I, you know, I really feel for, for real truckers and for, for Mike here. You know, God bless them. They've been delivering us food and essential goods since the beginning of the pandemic. You know, something like 85, 90 percent of them are vaccinated, and we all really appreciate their service. Unfortunately, you know, the issue Mike raised about um, the, 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 the cross-border mandate has entirely been lost now because the far right grabbed onto the idea, stole it, and have now associated it with extremism in our and are kind of associating truckers in this convoy with extremism, which is not fair at all to truckers, right? Not fair at all to real truckers. From day one, you know, the people who have organized this thing have been what we, we follow in the far right. You know, the, the organizers of the GoFundMe are on record making very Islamophobic comments in the past. Um, one of its loudest mouths there, a man named Pat King, has been associated with, you know, the Yellow Vest movement with the previous United We Roll convoy, there was actually another far-right convoy in 2019 that was extremely similar. They're even using the same um, posters and propaganda. And, you know, he's made so many incitements to violence and racist comments in the past. It's, it's a lot. And it's not just them. You know, the, org the Ontario organizer of this convoy used to be associated with or may still be associated with the Soldiers of Odin, which is a 
group founded by a Finnish neo-Nazi to hate Muslims. Um, and there's other groups that we're very concerned about, um, accelerationists uh, who want to violently overthrow the system, who are now also encouraging their members to join. Uh, in fact, one of the key figures of that, Jeremy McKenzie, his slogan is gun or rope the death threat um, to his critics. So we have not just a couple bad apples involved here, but the organizers themselves and some of the loudest spokespeople for this rally are bad apples. Mm. And all of the bad apples that we monitor in Canada, because they are you know, members of hate groups and so on and so forth, have come to support this rally. So that's the big issue here, right? I think, I right. think Mike has a genuine point uh, about talking with the government about you know, these, these vaccine mandates. I don't have a position on it one way or the other, but it seems like a reasonable thing that adults can have a conversation about. And I feel really badly for him and for other truckers that these extremists have stolen that issue and have now made it so toxic that there's no way that Ottawa is going to bow to their demands. So, Mike, hearing who exactly uh, uh, we're dealing with in some of these groups, is it enough to say, uh, you know, we denounce uh, this rhetoric, we don't agree with these far-right extre extremists and racists, or is it time for that protest, if they really do want to have that conversation, to physically separate themselves and say, we're going to go somewhere else because we just don't want to be in the same space or even in the same sentence as these folks? Yeah, well, and again, just let me reiterate that I don't believe the truckers in this in this convoy are the ones who are speaking this type of language. They're they're there for legitimate concerns and, and their own reasons. As far as physically separating from a group that's trying to take over your message, I think at this point it's going to be difficult. We've already got a couple hundred trucks in Ottawa, and the main part of the convoy isn't there yet. Um, so. If, if they're going to do it, we've got convoys coming from multiple different areas of the country that are that are converging on Ottawa. You know, they'd have to do it on the fly um, mm -hmm. and then try to make sure some of these some of these groups that may be attaching to them, uh, you know, aren't following. At this point, it's probably going to be difficult. Right. I think they just have to make sure that the people involved in this convoy from the trucking side make sure that they continue to denounce and let people know that the trucking industry is not involved in these extremist views. Evan, really quickly before we go, should officials be proactively, uh, um, you know, acting on some of the folks who are calling for violence, for calling for Canada to have its own January 6th? Is it too late to wait for that to escalate to that point? Mm -hmm. should, should police be acting on that? In my opinion, police already should have been acting on some of these individuals a while ago, specifically the ones who've been calling for violence. Uh, Pat King, who I mentioned before, who's become one of the most vocal proponents of this, has previously said that, you know, the only solution to, you know, public health measures and vaccines is bullets, right? So we have individuals here who are espousing violence, and then all of a sudden, one day ago himself, individuals like Jeremy McKenzie, are all of a sudden saying, if there is violence, it's not us, it's some kind of false flag attack, after, you know, months and years of telling their supporters that there's going to be a civil war or this problem is only solved with bullets um, or, you know, they need to find, you know, their their enemies, right? So right. there is kind of violent rhetoric surrounding this and law enforcement needs to take a, a close look at it. All right, we will watch and wait to see what happens tomorrow. Uh, Mike Million, president of the Private Motor Truck Council of Canada and Evan Balgord, the executive director of the Canadian Anti-Hate Network. Thanks to both of you for your time tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. And survivors are speaking out about comparisons some of those opposed to public health measures are making to the Holocaust. When I see these comparisons, it's traumatic to hear that because it really makes a mockery of my history, it makes a mockery of the Holocaust. Their stories, next. It was Holocaust Remembrance Day yesterday, and this year some are speaking out about the use of disturbing imagery by some protesting public health measures. That includes the suggestion that COVID restrictions could be compared to restrictions Jewish people lived under in Nazi Germany. Let's show you some examples. Last year in Rome, some protesters wore a yellow star as they denounced a plan for a COVID health pass. That star was the symbol Jews were forced to wear in Nazi Germany. When the city of Anchorage, Alaska considered a mask mandate, some opponents also wore those stars. 
And this week, the man on the right was wearing a yellow star while driving to the protest in Ottawa. We asked Holocaust survivors and a Holocaust educator to explain how all of that makes them feel. When I see the misuse of uh, anti-Semitic tropes or uh, images and words uh, associated with the Holocaust, I really feel it desecrates and distorts the memory of one of the greatest crimes against humanity in human history. My name is Michael Levitt, and I'm the president and CEO of the Canadian Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies. In our work with survivors, we are hearing from so many of them who are trying to process and understand how they can be seeing these images from uh, protests where the yellow star and the swastika are being used. This provides such immense hurt to so many of them because they watched their families and their lives being ripped apart um, under those symbols and under the Nazi regime, that to see it being used and manipulated in such a way, again, it's appalling. With the COVID shots, you're not being fully informed and you're not being given a choice. I'm Gershon Brüllinger. As an infant was taken to a uh, transit camp in Holland called Westerbork, from there to Bergen-Belsen in Germany, where I was liberated from in 1945 by the uh, Russians. When I see these comparisons, it's traumatic to hear that because it is that it, it, it really makes a mockery of my history, it makes a mockery of the Holocaust. It's an insult, an insult to the Holocaust. People were murdered for who they were. People were, uh, people were treated as cockroaches. And it's, this is, people live in a democracy. People have decided uh, um, to be either uh, get a vaccination or not. People are living in a democracy here. So to at all compare the death of six million Jews, there is absolutely no comparison. The yellow star is because I'm being viciously persecuted. My name's Saul Naiman. I'm a Holocaust survivor. When I see somebody on a COVID protest wearing a yellow star, uh, I just can't understand what, what kind of a message they're trying to convey. The yellow star was a symbol of degrading the Jewish people. One of the steps in the, in the development of the Holocaust uh, process. The yellow star was one of the symbols comparable, for example, to the tattoos that so many prisoners had on their arms. And there's, again, absolutely nothing that compares with the indignity of that yellow star uh, and what that has to do with COVID uh, or how that can be identified as a protest of COVID is, is beyond me. I find it to be degrading. Hi, my name is Nate Leipziger. My family was lost. My mother and my sister were murdered in Auschwitz and together with my, the rest of my extended family. Today, the people who are trying to put on a star, yellow star, they can take it off and that's the end of the story. We could not do that. If we took it off, we're sure to, to meet with our, with, with our death. The comparison has no basis in truth. Well, in Germany, the city of Berlin is cracking down on the appropriation of that symbol. Police have been authorized to document and confiscate yellow star badges, saying it trivializes the Holocaust and can be classified as secondary anti-Semitism. Well, when we come back, Bob Dylan joins a growing list of music legends who are cashing in. When you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. Why they're selling off their music catalogs for big bucks. That's next.
the master recording of that famous Bob Dylan track, along with his entire catalog, now belongs to Sony Music. The company bought all of Dylan's master recordings for an estimated $200 million. That's in addition to the $300 million Dylan got for selling his music publishing rights last year. Well, with touring, touring curtailed during the pandemic, it's a way for classic performers like Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, and others to cash in. And as Eli Glasner shows us, they're not the only ones. Look at Mother Nature on the run. From Neil Young Baby, we to Bruce Springsteen, Stevie Nicks, Bob Dylan, Dave Stewart of the Eurythmics, Blondie, ZZ Top, Tina Turner, Barry Manilow, and more. Music legends are cashing in. The value of music is only going up and up and up, and it makes kind of sense for these people to cash out right now. David Crosby pointed the finger at music streaming sites that pay fractions of a penny per song, saying, streaming stole my record money. I'm sure others feel the same. But it's not just the golden oldies. You From John Legend to Imagine Dragons, younger artists are also cutting deals. They're making a future bet of saying, our music is beloved right now. Who knows if people will still be streaming Imagine Dragons 15 years in the future. These guys are willing to pay us as though they are right now. So what's happening? Upcoming changes to tax laws in the U.S., low interest rates, and a new wave of investment companies supercharging the market. You guys are on TV. Oh, hello. In Toronto, Kilometer Music Group founder Michael McCarty is showing off their headquarters where they specialize in acquiring the rights of Canadian songwriters and beat makers. They're not only propelling Drake and Bieber and The Weeknd records, but they're propelling records by other superstars from other countries. But he says the demographics of streaming sites are changing. Older people embracing those platforms, and so the subscription base amongst people, you know, older people is growing, and of course they're listening to the music that they grew up with. As more users head to the platforms for their nostalgia fix, last year the number of new streaming songs played shrank, while older music jumped up to 73%. While the industry rushes to snap up those song rights, McCarty says there's never been a better time to make music, as long as you can find a buyer. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Well, next, we've seen lots of COVID-themed viral videos throughout the pandemic, but the latest Canadian hit surprised many. New Brunswick goes full vogue to get people boosted in our moment. That's next. After making the rounds online, this video dance battle between evil Omicron and benevolent boosters has exploded into Canada's latest COVID-themed viral hit, partly because of who made it. That's probably not what you typically think of when it comes to provincial health messaging, right? That's why it's tonight's moment. It has all the hallmarks of a classic viral video, slickly produced, culturally relevant, and very timely. Exactly what you'd expect from the government of New Brunswick. You're probably thinking, wait, what? Well, it's true. To encourage New Brunswickers to get boosted against Omicron, the government is upping its game. From offerings like this, to embracing the resurgence of voguing, a dance that first rose to fame among Harlem's predominantly black gay community back in the 70s. So what do people think? Well, some are a little confused, shall we say. Others, like some of Canada's prominent health experts, well, they love it. All right, you may not be able to bust a move after your booster, but it will increase your protection against severe illness. And anyone over 18 in New Brunswick is now eligible. So you can book that. That is it for The National here on January 28th. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.